My project is called The Brain House. It is an introductory professional development for teachers and administrators, specifically geared more towards uh, early elementary school. This would be a, an initial professional development with the hopes of continuing with a series that gets a little bit more in depth like talking specifically about literacy and learning or, um, you know, the need for movement and play in education. But again, this one is just, just an introductory greenhouse PD. So I would start with some questions for my teachers, hoping to get them thinking critically. Uh, those questions are, do you need to know about the brain functions to be a good teacher or administrator? Did your teacher or administrator training involve instruction on the process of learning? How might beliefs and narrowness be harmful to your personal and teaching philosophy? And how might learning about the brain impact your teaching experience? The brain is the organ of our profession. This is where I would gather some of the prior knowledge of our group, see kind of where we're starting with. Um, at the bottom, throughout my presentation, I list different opportunities for more interaction rather than just sitting and listening to me speak. When I taught a brain house course for my kindergartners, we also started by gathering prior knowledge. I really particularly like brains help us think and keep secrets. They help us have good days. Um, clicking on this image takes us to a NeuroMyth quiz. It's super short, it's only about 10 questions. I would go through this with my teachers and administrators. This right image is a list of 39 NeuroMyths. As you know, I think just talking about neuromas could be an entire professional development in itself. And here, finally, we have the what and why of this PD. Um, we'll talk briefly about some brain anatomy, the lobes and functions, the prefrontal cortex, the limbic system, specifically the amygdala and hippocampus. We'll talk about neurons and neuroplasticity. We'll talk about fight, flight, freeze, and fawn where we'll make various versions of maps of our brain house. And then at the end, we'll discuss a few connections between attention, time, memory, and learning. And this last part will really be a teaser for any future professional developments we do. Here we have the cerebral cortex, the thinking wrinkles. We'll break down and talk about the functions of the specific lobes. So for our prefrontal cortex, I have our chimpanzee to kind of illustrate the, the role of this part of the brain. For the limbic system, we have our ancient lizard. For the amygdala, we have our guard dog, our very over over-eager guard dog ready to protect us at any cost. Each part of the brain, I tried to use uh, characters that really match the qualities of that part. When I initially taught a, a brain house course for my kindergartners, we used an elephant as our hippocampus character because elephants are so known for having these great memories, but upon doing a little bit of research, I found out that dolphins actually have uh, better memories than any other animals, so we gotta use that one instead. Then we start talking about neurons and neuroplasticity. We have to start with an album cover and our neurons. All right, neurons are the information messengers. Learning involves changing and reinforcing connections between neurons. There are so many different ways that we can illustrate the job of the neurons, and this is a place where I would really spend a lot of time with my teachers. But I really like the illustration of the telephone pole, the lines being the neuron, the neural pathway, 
and then the pull itself being that that moment of synapse I especially like the fact that you can kind of simplify it and just have you know one one empty road with a straight line a straight neural pathway down there and then you can also have a more complex area where all of these neural pathways are converged and connected this is a really good opportunity during a PD to get everybody up and moving around and really visualize the role and the impact of neuro, neurons and neural pathways. So getting various pieces of string and yarn and connecting them between different members of the group, continually adding, and at some point changing some of those pathways. I think that every teacher needs to have the Hebian learning neurons the fire together wire together quote somewhere in their classroom large letters and I love a good visual so here we have our blank slate a set of neural pathways that we are all born with and then over time we make more and more connections and each of those connections changes the shape of the brain And then we get to talk about neuroplasticity, which is just the, the glimmer of hope in a deep, dark world of public education. The idea that there's still more to come, like you don't have to cram all of these academic learning points into kindergarten. You don't have to cram it all into first grade or second grade. There's time next year. There's time the year after that. It takes so much pressure off of the students and off of the teachers if we can really trust this. This is a really good opportunity to bring out some Play-Doh or some clay, some loose parts or items that we can stamp and really talk about the impact of you know these experiences or these learning points on our brain. Like all of these experiences shape what we have. This slide could be an entire professional development. Just briefly describing the process of learning um, as information moves from short-term to long-term memory, I think can really have an impact on the way that teachers view their lessons or their uh, unit plans or just the year in itself. And then another poster that I think every teacher needs to have. The brain is experience dependent. The environment actions and experience of an individual literally shapes their brain. This is so important. Fight, flight, freeze, and fawn. Anybody who works with children sees these responses daily. I think it is really important to note that these responses are to perceived threat. They do not have to be um, some really gargantuan threat like, you know, pending death or something. It's anything that feels threatening to that person in that specific moment. This is a survival instinct that originates in the amygdala, that part of our lizard brain that is over 200 million years old. This part of our brain developed in order to keep us safe. Now we don't have to run from tigers most of the time but our amygdala is still just as primed and ready to take care of us as it was 200 million years ago. When we have these responses to perceived threat, this release of adrenaline and neuroadrenaline cause experiences that I think we can all identify with. Um, the fight, flight, freeze, and fawn is an automatic response that processes information without the rest of the brain. Here we have an illustration of our characters from earlier located in their corresponding regions of the brain. So we have our limbic system lizard at the base. We have our eager guard dog and our hippocampus together here in the temporal region. And then up top of front, we have our wise and calm prefrontal cortex. Now most of the time, these areas of the brain are communicating with each other. But when we go into these fight, flight, freeze, and fawn responses, because our guard dog has sensed something, these areas of the brain disconnect. So in order to illustrate this, we have a staircase. Right now, communication between the prefrontal cortex and our amygdala and hippocampus. They can go up and down, they can talk, they can send text messages, whatever. 
But as soon as that guard dog starts barking, that staircase disappears. And some people refer to this as flipping your lid. They cannot talk to each other. So when this guard dog is freaking out, our prefrontal cortex cannot say, hey, maybe let's take some deep breaths or let's count to five, chill out everybody. That, that's not possible right now. Until we get that guard dog to really calm down, that communication cannot happen. So if we have a student who is constantly having to go into this fight response, it's going to be easier and easier for that child to slip into that mode. So here are some images of when I taught this brain house course to my kindergartners. We also did more um, three-dimensional representations of our upstairs brain and our downstairs brain. In this one, I really wanted to have them see what flipping your lid can look like, that disconnect. So they cut out pictures from magazines to represent corresponding areas to the brain. They made their houses. And then we taped the sides so that when you let the boxes connect, those brains are communicating, or the prefrontal cortex and your amygdala are communicating. And then that guard dog goes off, that top floor flips up, and that staircase is unusable. That communication ceases. And I really like Daniel Siegel's illustration of the hand, the hand model of the brain. And I've got a couple links to videos down here at the bottom. And then starting to wrap it up is when we talk about attention, the demand that public school especially places on children to be paying attention to the academic subject, being, to be paying attention to the teacher, to the school day itself is intense and it is not developmentally appropriate. It's frustrating for everybody involved. And I think if more people knew about what is actually possible and what attention looks like with the brain, things would have to change. Generally, the brain does poorly at continuous high level attention. In fact, genuine external attention can be sustained at a high and constant level for only a short time. Generally, 10 minutes or less. Now when I go in and observe classrooms, I see teachers expecting their children to sit crisscross applesauce on the carpet for 45 minutes to an hour at a time, and they're getting frustrated when the kids start laying down or twiddling their fingers or picking at the back of someone's shirt, or whispering to each other. If the teachers really knew the amount of time that they could expect their kids to pay attention, this wasted time being frustrated wouldn't happen as much. The last slide, Im implications. We go back and we re-ask the question we asked at the beginning of the PD. How might learning about the brain impact your teaching experience? 